Jetpack Joyride, a mobile game that I'm sure almost everybody has played at one point or another. I actually managed to unlock every jetpack and upgrade by jailbreaking my iPhone and fake spending $500 for everything. And so, I will be testing my illegitimate purchases and dissecting the physics of every single jetpack, using rocket science to figure out which one, in real life, would be the most effective. <laughs> Hello, I'm The Theorizer, and because I hate dwelling on awkward video intros that jump scare the ever-living daylights out of my viewers, I'll just start figuring this out. Starting with the first jetpack, the original, the machine gun jetpack. Could you strap a minigun to your back and use its ammunition to send you sky high? Yes. Yes, you could. But I have to address something before we can begin all of this rocket science mess. The main character, Barry. We don't know his height or weight. We could measure it, but it wouldn't make any sense. And his head is apparently huge, so we will just need to change him a bit and assume some things. First of all, that all of these jetpacks will be used in our world on a man who is 150 pounds and is 5 foot 7, the average. We will name him Bob, because whenever people don't have a name for a test subject, they name it Bob. This will allow us to figure out if these jetpacks could literally be real. Okay, let's begin. This is the formula we will be using most of the time for these jetpacks. It tells us the rocket thrust, or launching force. The rate at which mass ejects from the jetpack times the speed it ejects at tells us the thrust. But in this case, Bob's gravity will be pulling down against the thrust, so we should incorporate that in here as well. And side note, we will not be including the mass of the jetpacks in Bob's total weight, as it would get too complex, and we should just assume that it's going to be the same thrust on his whole body, even if he didn't have the jetpack. Okay, so the machine gun fires 60 bullets every second. Yes, I meticulously counted and calculated. According to Bob's height, the science lab is 15 meters high. Each bullet takes a sixth of a second to travel approximately 12 meters down. Thus, the bullets exit at 72 meters per second. Research says that one minigun bullet has a mass of 47 grams. Doing the math, the main character Barry, if he were Bob of course, accelerates upwards at 30 meters per second squared. And this proves one thing. This jetpack wouldn't work in real life. So, I did some research. Real miniguns shoot at an average of 930 meters per second. So formula popping with this, we get an upward force on Bob of 2100 newtons. Note that this is not the thrust, but rather the net force exerted upwards on Bob. So, we have our force. Bing, let's move on to the next one. Bubblegun jetpack. No, I refuse to calculate it. It has virtually no chance of ever working in real life, so we will immediately ignore it and move on to the gold platinum machine gun jetpack. It's very similar to the machine gun jetpack, but let's quickly assume that its ammunition is actually made of gold. Well, this would boost the total force up to 3800 newtons. We now have a new record. Now we do some actual rocket science with the traditional jetpack, but something extremely weird is going on here. The fire that comes out of it is colored strangely, and the pressure inside has to be so high that this formula says that the rocket thrust will be very, very, very high. NASA stands for Not Actually Space Astronauts, and thankfully for that, we have their calculus formulae, or lack thereof. Boom! Their algebra is here. Easy. Gamma is the specific heat ratio, a number that relates multiple thermodynamic properties of a gas. Confusing for you? Probably. So ignore all of this, as all you really need to know is that most rockets use hydrogen. Thus, we will assume that this one does as well. Hydrogen has a specific heat ratio of 1.41. Easy. R stands for the gas constant, just a constant number you typically find when dealing with gases. It is shown here. T is the temperature of the exiting fire. Using the Wien displacement law, we find that a fire with this color has an approximate temperature of 4560 degrees Celsius, or 4830 Kelvin. The M is for ejected mass, which in our assumption is everything the tank has in it. That can be found with this formula. So many formulas, but it's fun, get over it. Volume times density. The density of liquid hydrogen is 700 kilograms per cubic meter. And this is the formula for the tank shape's volume. Measuring and calculating everything, we get a mass of 2200 kilograms. What. The. Heck. Sagon. Pushing all of this into the fuel's exit velocity, we get a velocity of 523,507.4 meters per second. 
Holy Helvetica font. That's so meta as it's the font I'm writing this script with. A is the area that the fuel has to exit. Measuring and calculating with per square, that would be 0.19635 square meters. The P is for internal pressure, which can be found with the only useful chunk of Bernoulli's equation. The density in this case is for hydrogen in its gaseous form, which is 0.0899 kilograms per cubic meter. ti 83 ing this mother, we get a pressure of 12.3 billion pascals. What in the name of Brexit is this crap? Formulating the insane formula, we get a mass flow rate of 8.3 million kilograms per second. Pushing all of this into the thrust, we receive a jetpack launch force of 4.34 trillion newtons. See, I told you it was extremely ridiculous. I think we might have a winner already. Now we scale things down immensely by calculating a leaf blower. The mass flow rate in this case is for a fluid, the air, the gas. We can use this formula to find it. The area that the gas has to exit times the density of the gas times the velocity it exits at. Air is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. Measuring, the area is around 0.41 square meters. The gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, you know, for Earth. And the mass is 150 pounds or 68 kilograms. Also, Bob accelerates upwards at 30 meters per second squared, as we already established. I'm probably sounding very confusing with all this math, you probably might not understand it, but just pay attention to the answers, I guess, that's what this video is about. Anyways, rearranging, we find that we'd need a steroid pumped leaf blower that blows at 130 meters per second. Damn de Hoover, that is fast. It would probably send a person flying backwards if they blew leaves with that thing. Next is the fruit jetpack. Doing those same calculations as before, we find that it would need to fire in one second about 105.29 kilograms. 105.29 kilograms per second is insane. But since each fruit has a certain weight, this means that in one second, you'd either need 877 bananas, 87 100 strawberries, 1,030 apples, or 800 oranges. How healthy. Now we move on to the spaceship. And this jetpack uses the exact same rocket science as the traditional jetpack, so we'll need to use the same formulas. Except this time, the fire is a cyan color, giving it a higher temperature, and its dimensions are a bit different. So, this should be rather easy. Remeasuring, we get a new area. We'll assume that hydrogen is still the fuel, and that in the one second it takes to reach the roof of the laboratory, it uses up all of its fuel. Even though it doesn't, it would realistically do that. The formula we used before states that here, the mass ejected is 1,075 kilograms. Wow. Calculating the pressure, it's still quite high as usual. Calculating the exit velocity, popping it into the main equation, figuring out that other one, and solving, we get a rocket thrust force of 1.35 times 10 to the 12th newtons. Surprisingly, not even close to as much as before. It's about three times less. The jetpack beats spaceship any day. Now, we have by far the trickiest one to figure out, the laser. The laser jetpack seems to push Barry upwards using nothing but light. And as oddly surprising as this may be, that isn't too far-fetched. Light can push things, albeit with very, very little force. This is because photons may not have mass, but they do have momentum. So this is going to be a tricky one to figure out. To find the force, we'll need to know how many photons are hitting the ground every second, and the momentum of those photons. Photons per second can be found by calculating the seconds per photon and, of course, inverting it. And the seconds can be found by using the photon energy and the light power. The energy can be found with this formula, the Planck constant times the light frequency. And the frequency can be found with this formula, velocity of light divided by the wavelength, equationception. Obviously, light travels at the speed of light. <laughs> oh my god. Which is 299,792,458 meters per second. Yes, I memorized because I'm a nerd. Red light, like the one seen in this laser, has a wavelength of 650 nanometers. Converting to meters and calculating, we get a frequency of 461 terahertz. Plopping that frequency into the energy formula and multiplying it by the Planck constant, we get a pathetically minuscule energy of 305 zeptojoules. That's 19 zeros before the number in joules. Wow, that's tiny. Side note, according to the Wien Displacement Law, 
this laser has to be around 4,460 Kelvin. Cool. Or should I say hot? Yes, I should. Now the power. Here's where things get tricky, as we can go about power in many ways. How many watts is this laser? But because I love dealing with luminosity, we will go that route. But I'm going to switch things up a bit. To send Bob up at the constant 30 meters per second squared that all jetpacks in this game do, it would need a force of 2040 newtons. I'm going to move things around a bit to actually figure out how much power we'd need to do that. First, we need the photon momentum. That is found by dividing the Planck constant by the wavelength. Doing that, we get a ridiculously small momentum. Now doing some math, we'd require a power of 6.116 times 10 to the 11th watts. Assuming that the laser is 100% efficient and that it's fully red, like I mean, it's not green or blue or anything, so my assumption is correct, we calculate out a luminous flux of 418 trillion lumens or, considering the area it hits, around 5.88 quadrillion lux. Holy wow, that's almost 5 billion times as bright as the brightest sunlight. Insane. Now's the time for the vertical plane, the Red Berry. This should be easy. If you've watched any video where I deal with helicopters, you'll know what we're about to do. The slightly altered drag equation, the lift equation. This is quick and easy. The Red Berry has a blade length of 0.7125 meters. Using pi r squared, we already know the swept area. Air density is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. The thrust coefficient of an average helicopter blade is 0.009, and the force is 9.81 meters per second squared, times Bob's 68 kilograms. Third side note of the episode, or fourth, I've lost track. Side note, this is just the force required to keep him floating in the air, not to go up or down. Sort of like a real helicopter. Rearranging, we get a blade velocity of 194.46 meters per second, or almost 44 cycles every single second. Wow, but still not the best, not even close. Now this is a fun one, the hose jetpack. It shoots water. We can use that same formula as the one for the leaf blower, except instead of blowing air, it's blowing water. Water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Measuring, the exit area is 0.31 square meters, and calculating, we find that the water exits at around 40 meters per second. Doing the math, and I dare you to take a shot every time I say the word math, that's a thrust of 490,000 newtons. That should send Bob upwards at 7.2 kilometers per second per second. That's 7.2 kilometers per second in one second, 14.4 kilometers per second in two seconds, etc. Definitely strong. Next, we have the helicopter chair. Well, I calculated it, and it actually gave me the exact same helicopter thrust as the red berry. So those two are equal. Equally pathetic, that is. Now, probably the most odd one to figure out, the Flying V Guitar. It's tricky. It's not something we will calculate correctly, but we can try. This is most likely very off, but it's the closest thing we have to getting this. Force divided by area is pressure. Sound creates pressure waves through the air, which, if strong enough, can displace enough air to make things wiggle or vibrate. Loud speakers will shake things, as you'll know. If it's enough loudness and is done in a certain way, it could theoretically lift things off the ground. It's called acoustic levitation. So this is the closest thing we have to an answer. Bob's force downwards is his mass times gravity, and measuring the cross-sectional area of the apparent lightning bolt, we get a pressure of almost 20 kilopascals. Not too, too much, but converting that into decibels, we get a loudness of 180 dB, enough loudness to permanently deafen you. And rearranging into the intensity, we receive a sound intensity of nearly a million watts per square meter, a sound that could be heard 98,000 kilometers away. <laughs> That's one heck of a guitar. Certainly a point here, right? Now the shark head jetpack. I honestly don't need to go through all of the machine gun jetpacks calculations again, do I? It's literally the exact same, except it shoots half the bullets every second. So it's actually significantly weaker. Only about 644.22 newtons will push up on Bob. Now we have the Twister one. The jetpack's description states that it produces an F3 tornado. 
F3s typically send out winds that average at 180 miles an hour. Doing a bit of rotational math, that's 28 cycles every second. More than enough to lift most things off the ground. But since it's a tornado, it isn't something that could realistically be easily contained, so we'll have to knock this one out. Next up on the chopping block, we have the Golden Shark-Headed Machine Gun Jetpack. What's there to say? It's just like the shark one, but everything's golden. This boosts the force up to 1564 newtons. Not even close to the highest, but significant nonetheless. Side note, number... billion. I'm knocking out the angel wings because, well, they're not a jetpack. The chrome-plated afterburner is the afterburner of a dismantled F-111, says the description. Basic science, says myself. Wrong. This was a nasty one to work with. Its fire changes temperature, and it doesn't quite use typical rocket science, so I needed to go into the realm of model rockets and formulas that didn't involve ejecting mass. This thing is a good one. So filling in everything we already know, we just need to calculate the wind resistance and solve for thrust. Simplistic. Wind resistance in this weird formulas case is half rho ACD. Area is easy, as always, air density isn't even something we should ever dwell on as everyone already knows it by now, and the drag coefficient of a standing person is around 1.3. We now have our air resistance. But we mustn't neglect the height the rocket shoots to, and that can be found by a means of ridiculous thermal physics. Finding the heat energy produced by this afterburner, and using it as the potential energy, we find that a jetpack with this kind of heat would be the equivalent of it being sent up 160 kilometers into the sky. Wow. Now we can solve for the rocket thrust, which is a measly 1,054 newtons. Wow. Such work for virtually nothing. This junky, trashy blob of decommissioned war machine. Pathetic. Now is the time for this balloon. Once again, using the fluid flow formula, we figure out that this balloon would need to spit out its air at over 300 kilometers an hour, meaning it's 100% not something we could have in our world but it has to be magic in the world of Halfbrick. Now this one, I'll admit, was a ton of fun. The Golden Piggy Pack. I'm not even going to figure out if it could work, because it couldn't. But I do want to find out how much money you'd need to operate it. This rocket's description says that it spits out $1,000 bills. Closely analyzing, it fires one bill every one and a half frames. I recorded at 30 FPS. That's one bill every 0.05 seconds, 20 bills per second, or $20,000 every single second. What a waste of money. Now I also had some fun with this one, as I was switching up my process. The steam-powered jetpack. We can continue to use the fluid flow formula. Steam is 0.6 kilograms per cubic meter, and the exiting area is 0.31 square meters. But we can solve this for a velocity of 120 meters per second in order to propel Bob upwards at 30 meters per second squared. Using a chunk of the Bernoulli equation, we find that this steam needs to be pressurized to 0.15 psi inside. Not too high, I must say, but still, it's been pressurized to crap, and the steam physics is pretty cool. But you see, I wasn't done. Because steam burns are the worst possible kinds of burns you can get. So I literally figured out how hot this steam was. Using the gas formula that works so well for so much, we can figure it out. P is the pressure which we have. V is the volume, which I measured to be 1.22 cubic meters. R is the gas constant, and N is the number of moles in the steam. It's a chemistry thing. Using this, we can convert its mass into moles. The mass is just the steam's volume times its density, and the other thing is just a number corresponding to materials and their moles. For water, it's 18.02. And we get 40.62 moles which gives the steam a heat of 16 Kelvin, or negative 257 degrees Celsius. Who cares about steam burns? Since this thing is so highly pressurized, it would shoot freezing cold gas out of it, which I suppose should be a liquid since it's so cold, but not in this case. That would certainly freeze Bob to bits and shatter him. In summary, this jetpack is not only too dangerous, but wouldn't even work. And finally, finally, the last jetpack. The snowball shooting one. 
Measuring each snowball and looking up their density, we multiply it by its volume to get a mass of 352 kilograms per snowball. What the actual one chicken dinner? They launch out at 21 meters per second, and every second launches 10 balls, so they'd thrust Bob upwards with 74.2 kilonewtons, or an upwards acceleration of around 1,000 meters per second squared. And finally, we're done. So which jetpack is the most effective, realistic, and successfully accurate? Which one would be allowed to be sold in stores across the globe? The machine gun jetpack is very decent in its physics. If you could load it enough, it would decently propel you. It'll move on to the next round. Bubble gun won't even get you a millimeter off the ground. Gold platinum MGJP, even stronger than the normal MGJP. Moving on. The traditional jetpack is beyond powerful and easily moves on. The leaf blower. No leaf blower known to man can do what this one must do to lift a person. So sorry, it just won't work right now. Not moving on. The fruit jetpack could work, but the problem is the sheer amount of fruit you'd need. It would in fact not even allow you to go up in the first place, it would be so heavy. So its realism isn't there, no point. The blast off jetpack instantly moves on. The laser jetpack could theoretically work, but there is no known man-made object so bright. This is besides the fact that the heat would melt you. No point. The red berry could lift our guy, and so I will allow both it and the helicopter to move on to round two. The water jetpack is extremely powerful, safe, and realistic, and it moves right on into the next round with swimmingly easy ease. The sheer danger that is the Flying V jetpack is actually unfathomable. I can immediately tell that it's beyond unrealistic and dangerous, no point. Shark Head is weak, but moves on. Twister is unrealistic, dangerous, and stays behind. Wings aren't even a jetpack. Golden Shark Head is weak, but still powers through to round two. The chrome-plated afterburner is the surprisingly weak jetpack, but it will move on nonetheless. The balloon is so unrealistic that it's practically Pamela Anderson. The golden picky pack is rich but useless like the Kardashians. The steam power jetpack is colder than Simon Cowell's heart, and the snowball shooter is heavier than... I will stop right there. Did I just openly roast a bunch of celebrities? Yes. Yes, I did. I compared them to jetpacks, because Hollywood drama is composed of hard metallic people spitting fire. Round two, and we have the MGJP, the gold platinum MGJP, traditional blast off red berry helicopter thingy, water hose, shark head, golden shark head, and chrome plated afterburner. Right off the bat, every machine gun jetpack would risk you getting shot or a ricocheting bullet hitting you. Very risky and extremely difficult to control. The traditional and spaceship jetpacks are extraordinarily powerful, but their power can only be found in real rockets and would never actually fit into such a tiny device. The chrome-plated afterburner, on the other hand, while weak, is more realistic. But it is dangerous, but I'll keep it on my radar for the time being. The Red Berry and the Helicopter are both considerably weak, but they're very safe and would work. They'd be very easy to control, and to my surprise, are good enough to move on. Finally, the Hose. It is safe, easy to control, and beyond powerful. Moving on. Round 3, we've eliminated the dangers and we're left with the realistic, decent, safe jetpacks that could work in real life. We have the Red Berry, Helicopter, hose, and the chrome-plated afterburner. Okay, so the chrome-plated afterburner is a bit of a problem here. It just gets so hot, and that isn't good for us here. It does have a near-infinite supply of fuel, though, as it sucks in air. The water hose is good, but it must be connected, and the heavy hose may impede on the stability and handling of the jetpack. The red berry is a plane made vertical. Um, no. In the way it's done, no way it would work. And we find that the helicopter seat although weak, is the most fit for being a real jetpack. But the water one is still there. So I conclude today's video. If you want a real, real jetpack, use the chrome-plated afterburner. If you want an extremely safe, realistic, and already in the testing sort of jetpack, use the water one. And if you just want to get into the air safely, use the helicopter. I think I'm done for now on YouTube. I mean, geez, these calculations took a week to get through and I've never made a single video so long on this channel so far. I mean, there was the Stranger Things, but it was split up into two parts. And so until next week, the week after, or maybe in three weeks, 
I'm The Theorizer. For now, check out my second and third channels. I'll be there during this time.